seeking evidence for change uh, is one of the fundamentals of modern archaeological fieldwork. Um, it draws upon the widely held belief of uh, ontological equality amongst its participants, uh, often seeking to contrast that basis with the practice of earlier societies. However, our archaeological community is clearly not equal nor widely diverse. And whilst evidence suggests that it is evolving, um, it's evolving very slowly. The diversity profile of UK archaeology's participants, students, academics, field workers, regulators, non-professionals, uh, has changed very little in over a century. Behaviours and practices have developed that by their nature tend to exclude many, whilst at the same time entrenching the positions of a stereotypical elite. Archaeology can and should be uh, an exemplar for change, a paragon for other disciplines espousing community and intellectual values and crossing over academic and vocational boundaries. Hopefully in this paper I'm going to, I'm going to propose an agenda which envisages change, uh, promotes positive action towards creating equality and diversity uh, within our archaeological community. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with a couple of examples. Uh, they're intended to illustrate uh, the conservative, with a small c, nature of UK archaeology and how sometimes apparent advances in widening diversity, increasing equality, uh, can in fact be a little bit uh, illusory. Um, so let's start with Dorothy Garrett. Dorothy Garrett became the Disney Professor of Archaeology at Cambridge in 1938, following the retirement of Ellis Mims. Uh, the previous six Disney professors had, of course, all been men. Garrett's promotion was an acknowledgement of her undoubted abilities as both a field archaeologist and also her academic achievements, in particular her published works. There has been speculation that she wasn't the first choice for the job although her promotion was applauded at the time, uh, as you can see from the uh, little piece from the Cambridge Review, uh, an immense step towards complete equality. Um, was it, however, an advancement for women? Well, the subsequent Disney professors have been predominantly of singular gender. Uh, that might not mean anything. But, I mean, it should be noted, of course, that although... Um, Garrett became a professor in 1938, her gender did not allow her to vote, for example, in university elections until 1948. So uh, for most of uh, the time that she was actually in post, um, she had very little uh, power beyond that of, of uh, her actual title. Um, perhaps the most telling comment on her promotion is that made on the uh, current Cambridge Department of Archaeology webpage and uh, partly attributed to Tom Lethbridge, who was one of the unsuccessful applicants for Garrett's chair. All went well, Lethbridge concludes, the proper man got in. Uh, a Cambridge man uh, at that as well. I mean, Dorothy Garrett had the advantage of at least being considered one of the boys. Uh, contrast that with the situation of Basil Brown. Uh, at roughly the same time that Garrett was being considered for Disney Professor, a fellow Cambridge academic, Charles Phillips, was taking steps to exclude Basil Brown from the excavations at Sutton Hoo. Um, Basil Brown, as you can see from the details, a self-taught archaeologist, left school at the age of 12 to work on his father's farm, but developed an interest in both archaeology and astronomy. In 1938, he was uh, invited to investigate a series of mounds at Sutton Hoo, near Woodbridge and Suffolk, and he made the preliminary interpretation that the mounds contained the remains of ship burials. In 1939, Phillips, uh, from Cambridge, took over the excavations, brought in his own team to work on the main mound, and Brown and other colleagues from Ipswich Museum were excluded from the excavation. Uh, as Wikipedia suggests, Brown has never been fully accredited for his part in one of the UK's most stunning archaeological discoveries. Um, with the benefit of chronological distance, 
It seems the exclusion of Brown from the excavations and his limited mention in subsequent publication accounts was harsh. But we should perhaps ask ourselves, have things changed that much in the subsequent 80 years? It seems to me that the treatment of Brown could equally apply to many present-day archaeologists. Uh, the largest excavation ever to be carried out in Suffolk, for example, the EA1 project, was carried out by a company based in Carlisle, once again excluding the locally based units. Basil Brown's lack of a driving licence could exclude him at the first sort if he applied for a job these days. And we all know of many cases even now where archaeologists are denied credit for the work they've undertaken, particularly in publication. So why does this uh, matter? I arrive at the contention that UK archaeology in the past has been unfair. Even where it appears to embrace change, widen diversity and create a more equal discipline, that change can be illusory and effectively a facade behind which nothing much happens. Uh, and at this point I should maybe add the elephant in the room because I think this does make a difference. I accept that to many engaged in our discipline, equality and diversity does not present as a major problem. Indeed, for those who most fit the stereotype of being white, middle-aged, middle-class, heterosexual and male, engagement with diversity could well be a case of turkeys voting for Christmas. At present, it would not be an exaggeration to note that a concentrated campaign to address such issues is conspicuous by its absence. The recent Brexit referendum shows how heritage can be appropriated to represent political mythology and used to marginalise minority groups, sometimes very large minorities. As a multicultural nation that espouses equality as a right, surely we need to ensure that heritage is multivocal and multi-participatory. The case needs to be made that heritage is a sum of all its diverse parts and to ensure that all sectors are participants whether in the field or in the study room, with the widest possible contribution to analysis and interpretation and wholly representative of the opinion and nuance that full participation brings. In my opinion, our discipline at present contains a far too narrow range of participants. Change is needed, change which will not only benefit our discipline, but could provide, as I said earlier, an exemplar for other disciplines or professions who might also wish to encourage diversification amongst its participants. So how can this come about? In the first instance, I suggest that we need to increase and widen the diversity of heritage participants outside of the vocational or academic spheres. This was considered by a CBA working party in a report back in 2012, and it's difficult to measure the effect that this report has had in increasing uh, because it's largely been ignored. Uh, it may require a concerted campaign to remind the heritage organisations that set it up, uh, CBA, National Trust, Historic England, um, that um, it exists and, and need to adopt some of its recommendations. Secondly, having increased diversity in participation, there is a need to translate that into entry at an academic and vocational level. A recent British Academy and Historic England stroke CIFA report, whilst addressing the subject of widening the diversity of the audience, failed to come up to the mark regarding diversifying the workforce. Although to their credit, and after some pressure from members, CIFA had established an Equality and Diversity Working Party tasked with addressing these issues and due to report back next year. It should be noted that whilst considerable effort in general is being made to widen our diversity at university level, archaeology seems to be moving in the opposite direction. The res relatively democratic archaeology A-level has been replaced by more elitist A-levels in ancient languages, for example, ancient history and classical civilization, which of course require more specialist teaching requirements at secondary level and probably fall beyond the scope of many pressured school budgets. A-level entry requirements for the majority of university students are BBC, but it should be noted that Worcester, who asked for three Cs, have the most success with graduates moving into archaeological employment, and there seems to be a message there. At the other end of the scale, there are a diminishing number of distance learning courses 
at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, and that has to be to the disadvantage of working archaeologists who might wish to upskill. Entry routes into professional archaeology, of course, are not restricted to university. There is scope for apprenticeships and other training programmes to be used to widen diversity. In fact, there's a very strong argument, at least in my opinion, for apprenticeships to be used by the profession to affirm an increase where minorities are currently underrepresented. Uh, a Level 7 Master's Apprenticeship has been proposed by CIFA specifically to address the question of at-work specialist training. Uh, the upskilling to which I previously referred. Uh, but this is a number of years in the future, I think. And then finally, we come down to legislation. And we have the Equality Act of, of 2010 to consider. Um, this slide has been up uh, several times this week already. Uh, but it's interesting that the protected characteristics under the Equality Act um, could well be those which, which enable us in archaeology to increase diversity and, and to widen equality. Uh, so I won't go into detail here other than to remind you that uh, the Equality Act uh, exists. Um, it compels employers not to discriminate, discriminate against employees and applicants, but also to make sure that reasonable adjustments to accommodate protected characteristics are possible. Um, and so I'm not going to address every characteristic here, and I suspect that Teresa has something to say on the question of enabled archaeologists after me. But I will mention a couple of examples. Uh, returning earlier to, to what I said earlier about Basil Brown's driving licence, uh, this probably would mean that uh, if he uh, did apply for a job these days, he probably wouldn't make the cut um, if a driving licence was stated as an essential requirement. But what, however, of an enabled archaeologist who was unable to drive for medical reasons but is otherwise fully capable of the job at hand? Surely in such instances, employers should be required to make a reasonable adjustment. It seems to me stating, for example, that a driving licence is preferred rather than essential would go some way to achieving that adjustment. Another example, what if a woman returning to work after maternity leave who was then told that she was required to be away from home overnight for weeks on end or with no childcare or nursing facilities on offer? Again, surely it's reasonable to ask an employer to make adjustments that would allow her to return home at the end of the day or to be able to nurse uh, during the day. Um, I'll let you think on about the scope of the Equality Act because obviously some of the other um, protected characteristics, uh, you, you may all have uh, personal views and sometimes even personal experience. Uh, to my knowledge, no archaeologist has so far taken the law to its potential end point, which is to, to actually raise this question and, and to see what remedy the law might have. But at the same time, I also hear that potentially difficult applicants are being weeded out at the first sort, and that does not fill me with hope coming to an end. I will finish by saying that archaeology should be more outgoing about its willingness to diversify its workforce. And at a time when it is claimed there is a lack of available archaeologists, it should be more adventurous in its recruitment policies. There are plenty of archaeologists out there who, with a little bit of encouragement, both spiritual and temporal, could be tempted into, or in many cases back into, the profession. As I mentioned earlier, our discipline has the capacity to provide a shining example for other disciplines where there is also a perceived lack of diversity. I think as a result, we would all benefit. Thanks.